The Planetoid of Peril by Paul Ernst. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Planetoid of Peril by Paul Ernst. He pointed it at the incredible body. Undaunted by crazy tales of an indestructible presence on asteroid Z-40, Harley 2Q14N20 sets out alone to face and master it. Harley 2Q14N20 stops for a moment outside the great dome of the Celestial Developments Company. Moodily, he stared at their asteroid development chart. It showed, as was to be expected, the pick of the latest asteroid subdivision projects. The Celestial Development Company, established far back in 2045, would handle none but the very best. Small chance of his finding anything here. However, as he gazed at the chart, hope came suddenly to his face, and his heart beat high under his sapphire blue tunic. There was an asteroid left for sale there one blank space among the myriad pink-lettered sold symbols. Could it be that here was the chance he had been hunting for so desperately? He bent closer to read the description of the sphere, and hope faded gradually from his countenance. According to its orbit and location, and the spectroscopic table of its mineral resources, it was a choice planetoid indeed. Of course, such a rich little sphere listed for sale by the luxurious Celestial Developments Company, would cost far more than he could ever rake together to pay for an asteroid. Shaking his head, he adjusted his gravity regulator to give him about a pound and a half of weight, and started to float on. Then, his lips twisting at his own absurd hopefulness, he stopped again, and after another moment of indecision, turned into the archway that led to the concern's great main office. After all, it wouldn't hurt to inquire the price, even though he knew in advance it would be beyond his humble means. A youngster in a pale green of the one-bar neophyte in business promptly glided toward him. "'Something for you today, sir?' he asked politely. "'Yes,' Harley said. "'I'm looking around for a planetoid. Want to get a place of my own out away from Earth. Something, you understand, that might turn out to be a profitable investment.' as well as furnishing an exclusive home site. I see on your chart that you have a sphere left for sale, in the Red Belt. So I came in to ask about it. Ah, you mean asteroid Z-40, said the youngster, gazing with envious respect at the ten-bar insignia with the cross go drills that proclaimed Harley to be a mining engineer of the highest rank. Yes, that is still for sale. A splendid sphere, sir, listed at a remarkably low figure. Half a million dollars. Half a million dollars, exclaimed Harley. It was an incredibly small sum. Scarcely the yearly salary of an unskilled laborer. Are you sure that's right? Yes, that's the correct figure. Down payment of one-third, and the remaining two-thirds to be paid out of the exploitation profits. Here the conversation was interrupted by an elderly gray-haired man with a six-bar dollar-mark insignia of a business executive on his purple tunic. He had been standing nearby, and at the mention of asteroid Z-40 had looked up alertly. He glided to the two with a frown on his forehead, and spoke a few curt words to the neophyte, who slunk away. "'Sorry, sir,' he said to Harley. "'Z-40 isn't for sale.' "'But your young man just told me it was,' replied Harley loath to give up what had begun to look like an almost unbelievable bargain. He was mistaken. It's not on the market. It isn't habitable, you see. What's wrong? Hasn't it an atmosphere? Oh, yes, one that is exceptionally rich in oxygen, as is true with all the spheres we handle. With a late-model oxygen concentrator, one would have no trouble at all existing there. Is the speed of its revolution too great? Not at all. The days are nearly three hours long, annoying until you get used to it, but nothing like the inferior asteroids of the Mars Company, where days and nights are less than ten minutes in duration. Well, is it barren, then? 
no minerals of value no vegetation the spectroscope shows plenty of metals including heavy radium deposits the vegetation is as luxuriant as that of semi-tropical earth then why in the name of beetlejuice said harley exasperated won't you sell the place to me it's exactly what i've been looking for and what i despaired of finding at my price i'm forbidden to tell why it isn't for sale said the executive starting to float off it might hurt our business reputation if the truth about that bit of our celestial properties became widely known oh disintegrate it all why wasn't that thing erased from the charts weeks ago wait a minute harley caught him by the arm and detained him you've gone too far to back out now i'm too eager to find such a place as your z-40 to be thrown off the subject like a child why isn't it for sale the man tightened his lips as though to refuse to answer then shrugged i'll tell you he said at last but i beg you to keep it confidential if some of our investors on neighboring asteroids ever found out about the peril adjoining them on z-40 they'd probably insist on having their money back he led the way to a more secluded spot under the big dome and spoke in a low tone with many a glance over his shoulder to see if anyone were within earshot z-40 is an exceptionally fine bit of property it is commodious about twenty miles in diameter its internal heat is such that it has a delightful climate in spite of the extreme rarity of atmosphere common to even the best of asteroids it has a small lake in fact it has about everything a man could want yet as i said it is uninhabitable his voice sank still lower you see sir there's already a tenant on that sphere a tenant that was in possession long before celestial developments company was organized and it's a tenant that can't be bought off or reasoned with it's some sort of beast powerful ferocious and it makes it certain death for a man to try to land there a beast echoed harley what kind of a beast we don't know in fact we hardly even know what it looks like but from what little has been seen of it it's clear that it is like no other specimen known to universal science it's something enormous some freak of animal creation that seems invulnerable to man's small weapons and that's why we can't offer the place for sale it would be suicide for anyone to try to make a home there has anyone ever tried it asked harley any competent adventurer i mean yes twice we sold z-40 before we realized that there was something terribly wrong with it both buyers were hardy intrepid men the first was never heard of after thirty-six hours on the asteroid the second man managed to escape in his blinko dart and came back to earth to tell of a vast creature that had attacked him during one of the three-hour nights his hair was white from the sight of it and he's still in a sanitarium slowly recovering from the nervous shock harley frowned thoughtfully if this thing is more than a match for one man why don't you send an armed band with heavy atomic guns and clear the asteroid by main force my dear sir don't you suppose we've tried that twice we sent expensive expeditions to z-40 to blow the animal off the face of the sphere but neither expedition was able to find the thing whatever it is possibly it was intelligent enough to hide if faced by overwhelming force when the second expedition failed we gave up poor business to go further already z-40 has cost us more than we could clear on the sale of a half a dozen planetoids for a long time harley was silent the company was a hard-headed cold-blooded concern anything that kept them from selling an asteroid must be terrible indeed his jaw set in a hard line you've been honest with me he said at length i appreciate it just the same i want to buy z-40 maybe i can oust the present tenant i'm pretty good with a ray pistol it would be poor policy for us to sell the asteroid we don't want to become known as the firm that trades in globes on which it's fatal to land surely my fate is none of your worry urged harley the asteroid began the executive with an air of finality is not for man it's got to be cried harley 
Then, with a perceptible effort, he composed himself. There's a reason. The reason is a girl. I'm a poor man, and she's an heiress to a fabulous... Well, frankly, she's the daughter of 3W28W12 himself. The executive started at the mention of the universally known number. I don't want to be known as a fortune hunter, and my best bet is to find a potentially rich asteroid, cheap, and develop it, incidentally getting an exclusive estate for my bride and myself, far out in space, away from the smoke and bustle of urban earth. Z-40, save for the menace you say now has possession of it, seems to be just what I want. If I can clear it, it means the fulfillment of all my dreams. With that in view, do you think I'd hesitate to risk my neck? No, said the executive slowly, looking at the young man's powerful shoulders and square-set chin and resolute eyes. I don't think you would. Well, so be it. I'd greatly prefer not to sell you Z-40. But if you want to sign an agreement that we're released from all blame or responsibility in case of your death, you can buy it. I'll sign any agreement you please, snapped Harley. Here is a down payment of a hundred and seventy thousand dollars. My name is Harley, signed 2Q14N20. Unmarried, though I hope to change that soon, if I live. Occupation Mining Engineer, 10 bar degree. Age 34. Now draw me up a deed to Z-40, and see that I am given a stellar call number on the switchboard of the Radivision Corporation. I'll drop around there later and get the receiving unit. Good day. And, adjusting his gravity regulator to lighten his weight to less than a pound, he catapulted out the archway. Behind him, a prosaic business executive snatched a moment from a busy day to indulge in a sentimental flight of fancy. He had read once of curious, old-time beings called knights, who had undertaken to fight and slay fire-breathing things called dragons, for the sake of an almost outmoded emotion referred to as love. It occurred to him that this brusque man of action might be compared to such a being. He was undertaking to slay a dragon and win a castle for the daughter of 3W28W12. The romantic thought was abruptly broken up by the numeral. It jarred so, somehow, that modern use of numbers instead of names, when thinking of sentimental passages of long ago. The rose is fair, but in all the world there is no rose as fair as thou, my princess. 3W28W12? No, that wouldn't do. Cursing himself for a soft-headed fool, he went to deliver a stinging rebuke to somebody for not having blocked Z-40 off the asteroid chart weeks before. Harley, 2Q14N20, recited the control assistant at Landon Field. Destination Asteroid Z-40, Red Belt. Arc 31.3470. Sites corrected. Flight period 12 minutes 48 seconds past 9 o'clock. All set, sir? Harley nodded. He stepped inside the double shell of his new Blinko Dart, that small but excellent quality production craft that had entirely replaced the cumbersome spaceships of a decade ago, and screwed down the manhole lid. Then, with his hands on the gravity bar, he gazed out the rear panel, ready to throw the lever at the control assistant's signal. The move was unthinkingly, mechanically made. Too many times he had gone through this process of being aimed by astronomical calculation and launched into the heavens to be much stirred by the wonder of it. The journey to Z-40 in the dart was no more disquieting than, a century and a half ago, before the United States had fused together into one vast city, a journey from Chicago to Florida would have been in one of the inefficient gasoline-driven vehicles of that day. All his thoughts were on his destination, and on a wonder as to what could be the nature of the thing that dwelt there. He'd just come from the sanitarium, where the man who bought Z-40 before him was recovering from nervous exhaustion. He'd gone there to try to get first-hand information about the creature the executive at the Celestial Development Company had talked so vaguely of, and the tale the convalescent had told him of the thing on the asteroid was as fantastic as it was sketchy. A tremendous, weirdly manlike creature looming in the dim night. 
a thing that had seemed a part of the planetoid itself fashioned from the very dirt and rock from which it had risen a thing immune to the ray pistol that latest and deadliest of man-made small arms a thing that moved like a walking mountain and stared with terrible stony eyes at its prey that was what the fellow said he had faintly made out in the darkness before his nerves had finally given way he had impressed harley as being a capable kind of person too not at all the sort to distort facts nor to see imaginary figures in the night there was the matter of the stone splinter however which certainly argued that the one prematurely white-haired fellow was a little unbalanced and hence not to be believed too implicitly he'd handed it to harley and gravely declared that it was a bit of the monster's flesh why it's only a piece of rock harley had exclaimed before he could check himself did you ever see a rock like it before turning it over in his hands harley had been forced to admit he never had it was of the texture and roughness of granite but more heavily shot with quartz or tritomite than any other granite he'd ever seen it had a dull opalescent sheen too but it was a rock all right it's a piece of that thing's hide the man had told him it flaked off when it tried to pry open the manhole cover on the ray dart a moment after that i got radivision arc directions from london field aimed my sights and shot for earth it was a miracle i escaped but surely your ray pistol hardly had begun preserving a discreet silence about the man's delusion concerning the stone splitter i tell you it was useless as a toy never before have i seen any form of life that could stand up against a ray gun but this thing did this was another statement harley had accepted with a good deal of reservation he had felt sure the weapon the man had used had a leak in the power chamber or was in need of recharging or something of the kind for it had been conclusively proved that all organic matter withered and burned away under the impact of the ranchon ray nevertheless discounting heavily the convalescent's wild story only a fool would have clung to the conviction that the menace on z-40 was a trivial one there was something on that asteroid something larger and more deadly than harley had ever heard of before in all his planetary wanderings he squared his shoulders whatever it was he was about to face it man against animal he was reasonably certain his ray gun would down anything on two legs or ten if it didn't well there was nothing else that could and he'd certainly provide a meal for the creature assuming it ate human flesh a mechanic tapped against the rear view panel to recall his wandering attention the control assistant held up his hands fingers outspread to indicate that there were ten seconds left harley's hand went to his throat where was hung a locket a lovely but useless trinket of the kind once much worn by earth women and his fingers tightened tenderly on it it had belonged to bernice three w twenty eight w twelve's great great grandmother and bernice had given it to him as a token with luck my dear he whispered aloud with luck there was a slight vibration he threw the gravity bar over to the first notch earth dropped plummet-like away from him he pushed the bar to the limit leg and at a rate of hundreds of miles a second was repelled from earth toward z-40 and the thing that skulked there with a scarcely perceptible jar he landed on the small sphere that he hoped was to be his future home before opening his manhole lid he went from panel to panel of the dart cautiously reconnoitering he had elected to land beside the little lake that was set like a three hundred acre gem on the surface of z-40 and it was more than possible that the enemy had its den nearby however a careful survey of the curved landscape in all directions failed to reveal a glimpse of anything remotely threatening he donned his oxygen concentrator in appearance a simple tube of a thing projecting about six inches above his forehead and set in a light metal band that encircled his head adjusting his gravity regulator so he wouldn't inadvertently walk clear off into empty space he calculated his weight would be less than a twentieth of an ounce here he stepped out of the dart and gazed around at the little world before him was the tiny lake 
of an emerald green hue in the flashing sunlight around its shores and covering the adjacent softly rolling countryside as far as the eye could reach was a thick growth of carmine tinted vegetation squat enormous leaved bushes low sturdy trees webbed together by innumerable vines to the left and right miniature mountains reared ragged crests over the abbreviated horizon making the spot he was in a peaceful lovely valley he sighed there was everything here a man could wish for provided he could win it loosening his ray pistol in its holster he started to walk slowly around the lake to choose a site for the house he intended to build on the opposite shore he found a place that looked suitable a few yards back from the water's edge curling in a thick crescent like a giant sleeping on its side was a precipitous outcropping of rock curious stuff rather like granite that gleamed with dull opalescence in the brilliant sunlight with that as a sort of natural buttress behind the house and with the beautiful lake as his front door yard he'd have a location that any man might envy he returned to his dart hopped back across the lake in it and unloaded his go drill with this he planned to sink a shaft that would serve in the future as a cellar for his villa and in the present as an entrenchment against danger but now the swift night of z forty was almost upon him the low slant of the descending sun warned him that he had less than ten minutes of light left until the next three-hour day should break over the eastern rim he placed the drums in the flexible hose of the sco drill so that he could begin operations with it as soon as the dawn broke and started to walk toward the precipitous outcropping of quartzoferous stone immediately behind the home site he'd picked he would climb to the top of this for a short look around and then return to the dart in which double-hulled metal fortress he thought he would be safe from anything he had almost reached the rock outcropping when the peculiarities of its outline struck him anew he'd already observed that the craggy mound rather resembled a sleeping formless giant the closer he got to it the more the resemblance was heightened and the greater grew his perplexity it sprang straight up from the carmine underbrush like a separate heap of stone cast there by some mighty hand one end of it tapered down in a thick ridge and this ridge had a deep horizontal cleft running along it which made it appear as though it were divided into two leg-like members in the center of the mound swelled a resemblance of a paunchy trunk with sagging shoulders this was topped by a huge nearly round ball that looked for all the world like a head there were even rudimentary features it was grotesque one of those freak sculptures of nature harley reflected that made it seem as though the old girl had a mind and artistic talent of her own he scrambled through the brush until he reached that part of the long mound that looked like a head there as the sun began to stream the red lines of its descent over the sky he prepared to ascend for his view of the surrounding landscape he'd got within twenty feet of the irregular ball and had adjusted his gravity regulator to enable him to leap to its top when he stopped as abruptly as though he had been suddenly paralyzed over the two deep pits that resembled nostrils in the grotesque mask of a face he thought he had observed a quiver the illusion had occurred in just the proper place for an eyelid it was startling to say the least i'm getting imaginative said harley he spoke aloud as a man tends to do when he is alone and uneasy i'd better get a tighter grip on my nerves or oh god coincident with the sound of his voice in the thin quiet air the huge stump that looked like legs stirred slightly a tremor ran through the entire mass of rock and directly in front of harley less than twenty feet from where he stood a sort of half-moon shaped curtain of rock slid slowly up to reveal an enormous staring eye frozen with a terror such as he had never felt before in a life filled with adventure scarce breathing harley glared at the monstrous spectacle transpiring before him a hill was coming to life a granite cliff was growing animate it was impossible but it was happening the half-moon curtains of rock that so eerily resembled eyelids blinked heavily 
he could hear the faint rasping like the rustle of sandpaper as they did so one of the great stumps moved distinctly independent of the other three columnar masses of rock arms or tentacles with a dozen hinged joints in each slowly moved away from the parent mass near the base of the head and extended toward the earthman still in his trance with his heart pounding in his throat until he thought it would burst harley watched the further awful developments the eyelids remained open disclosing two great dull eyes like poorly polished agates which stared expressionlessly at him there was a convulsion like a minor earthquake and the mass shortened and heightened its bulk raising itself to a sitting position the three hinged irregular arms suddenly extended themselves to the full in a thrust that barely missed him they were tipped those arms with immense claws like interlocking rough hewn stone fingers they crashed emptily together within a few feet of harley then and not until then did the paralysis of horror loosen its grip on the human he tore its ray pistol from its holster and pointed it at the incredible body an angry blue-green cone of light leapt from the muzzle and played over the mighty torso nothing happened he squeezed the trigger back to the guard the blue-green beam increased in intensity and a crackling noise was audible under that awful power the monster should have disappeared dissolved into a greasy mist but it didn't the light beam from the ray gun died away the power was exhausted it was only good for about ten seconds of such an emergency full force discharge after which it must be recharged again the ten seconds were up and the gigantic creature against which it had been directed had apparently felt no injury from a beam that would have annihilated ten thousand men the now useless ray pistol slipped from his limp fingers stupefied with the horror of the futility of the deadly ranchon ray against this terrible adversary he stood rooted to the spot then the thing reached for him again and his muscles were galvanized into action to instinctive stupid reasonless action screaming incoherently mad with the horror of the stone claws that had clutched at him he turned and ran in great leaps he bound away from the accursed lake and made for the taller trees and thick vegetation at a distance from the shore it was the worst thing he could have done there was a chance he could have reached his dart had he thought of it and soared aloft out of reach but he thought of nothing all he wanted to do in that abysmal fear that can still make a mindless animal out of a civilized man was to run and hide to get away from the fearful monster that had risen up to glare at him with those stony pitiless eyes and to reach for him with two-fingered bands like grinding rock vices just as the sun fell below the rim of the asteroid plunging it into a darkness only faintly relieved by the light of the stars he crashed into the deeper underbrush a trailing creeper tripped him in his mad flight he fell headlong to lie panting sobbing for breath in the thick carpet of blood-colored moss behind him from the direction of the lake he heard a sudden clangor as of rock beating against metal this endured only a short time then the solid ground beneath him shook slightly and an appalling crash of trees and underbrush to the rear of him told him that the stone colossus was on his trail he leapt to his feet and continued his great bounds over the sharply curving surface of the asteroid banging against tree trunks bruising himself against stones falling in the darkness to rise again and flee as before in a mad attempt to distance the crashing sound of pursuit behind him then he felt himself writhing in the thin air as his flying course took him over the edge of a cliff down down he fell to land in a dense bed of foliage far below something hit his head with a terrific force pinwheels of light flashed before his eyes to fade into velvety nothingness slowly uncertainly he wavered back to consciousness for a moment he was aware of nothing save that he was lying on some surface that was jagged and uncomfortable and that it was broad daylight he opened his eyes and saw that he was reclining across a springy bed formed of the top of the tree 
Ahead of him loomed a cliff about a hundred feet high. Remembrance suddenly came to him. The unreasoning rush through the underbrush, the nightmare creature lumbering swiftly after him, the fall over the cliff into the top of this tree. With a cry, he sat up, expecting to see the stone giant nearby and poised to leap. But it was nowhere in sight. Nor, listening as intently as he would, could he hear the sounds of its crashing path through the brush. Somehow, for a moment at least, he had been saved. Perhaps his disappearance over the cliff edge had thrown it off his track. He became aware of the fact that it was difficult for him to breathe. His lungs were heaving in a vain effort to suck in more oxygen, and his tongue felt thick, as though he were being strangled. Then he saw that his oxygen concentrator had been knocked from his head when he fell, and was dangling from a limb several feet away. It was almost out of breathing range. Had it fallen on through the branches to the ground, he would have died in his unconsciousness, in the rarefied atmosphere. He reached for it settled the band around his head again after once more listening and peering around to make sure the rock colossus was not about he descended the tree that had saved his life and began to walk in the direction he judged the lake to be he would get into his dart cruise aloft out of harm's way and perhaps think up some effective course of action he was thinking clearly now and in the glare of daylight no longer an unreasoning animal fleeing blindly over a dim-lit foreign sphere. He was unable to understand his panic of the night. Afraid? Of course he had been afraid. What man wouldn't have been at the sight of that monstrous thing? But that he, Harley 2Q14N20, should have lost his head completely and gone plunging off into the brush like that seemed unbelievable. To the depths of his soul he felt ashamed and to his own soul he made the promise that he would wipe out, in action, that hour of cowardice. As he wound his way through the squat, carmine forest, he tried to figure out the nature of the thing that had crashed balefully after him in the black hours. It had seemed made of rock, a giant, primitive stone statue imbued with life. But it was impossible that that should really be fashioned of rock, at least it ought to be impossible rock is inorganic inanimate it simply couldn't have the spark of life in it harley had seen many strange creatures on many strange planets but never had he seen inorganic mineral matter endowed with animation nor had anyone else yet the thing looked as though it were made of stone of some peculiar quartz suffused granite proving that the one white-haired man he had talked to in the sanitarium had not been mad at all, but only too terribly sane. The creature's very eyes had had a stony look. Its eyelids had rasped like stone curtains rubbing together. Its awful two-fingered hands, or claws, had ground together like stones rubbing. Was it akin to the lizards, the cold-blooded life of Earth? Was this rocky exterior merely a horny shell, like that of a turtle? No. Horn is horn and rock is rock. The two can't be confused. The only theory Harley could form was that the giant beast was in some strange way a link between the animal and mineral kingdoms. Its skeletal structure, perhaps, was silicate in substance, extending to provide an outside covering that had hardened into actual stone, while forming an interior support to flesh that was half organic, half inorganic matter. Some such silicate construction was to be found in the sponge of Earth. Could this be a gigantic relative of that lowly creature? He did not know, and couldn't guess. He wasn't a zoologist. All he knew was that the thing appeared to be formed of living, impregnable stone. He knew also that this fabulous creature was bent on destroying him. At this point in his reflections, the glint of water came to his eyes, between the tree trunks ahead of him. He had come back to the lake. For moments he stood behind one of the larger trees on the fringe and searched around the shore for sight of the rock giant. It was nowhere in evidence. 
Rapidly he advanced from the forest and ran for the dart. From a distance it looked to be all right, but as he drew near a cry rose involuntarily to his lips. In a dozen places the double hull of the little spacecraft was battered in. The manhole lid was torn from its braces and bent double. The glass panels, unbreakable in themselves, had been shoved clear into the cabin, their empty sash frames gaping at Harley, like blind eyes. Never again would that Blinko dart speed through the heavens. He went to the spot where he had left his scow drill, and a further evidence of the thing's cold-blooded ferocity was revealed. The intricate mechanism had been wrenched into twisted pieces. The drums were battered in, and the flexible hose lengths torn apart in shreds. The inventor himself couldn't have put it in working order again. He was hopelessly trapped. He had no means of fighting the Colossus. He had no way of escaping into space, nor of returning to Earth and trying to raise a loan that would allow him to come back here with men and atomic guns. He hadn't even a way to entrench himself in the ground against the next attack. For an instant his hair prickled in a flash of the blind panic that had seized him a few hours before. With a tremendous effort of will he fought it down. This, the destruction of his precious dart and drill, was the result of one siege of insensate fear. If he succumbed to another one, he might well dash straight into the arms of death. He sank to the ground and rested his chin on his fists, concentrating all his intellect on the hopeless problem that faced him. The surface of Z-40 was many square miles in extent, but if he tried to hide himself he knew it was only a question of time before he would be hunted down. The asteroid was too tiny to give him indefinite concealment. Flight, then, was futile. But if he didn't try to conceal himself in the sparse forest lands, it meant that he must stay to face the monster at once, which was insanity. What could he do, barehanded, against that thirty-foot, three-tentacled, silicate mass of incredible life? It was useless to run, and it was madness to stay and confront the thing. What, then, could he do? The sun had slid down the sky, and the red of another swift dusk was heralding the short night before he shook his head somberly and gave the fatal riddle up. He rose to his feet, intending to make his way back to the concealment, such as it was, of the forest. It might be that he could find safety in some lofty treetop till day dawned again. Then he stopped and listened. What was that? From far away to the left he could hear the faint sounds of some gargantuan stirring and coincident with the flickering out of the last scrap of sunlight a distant crashing came to his ears as an enormous body smashed like an armored ship through the trees and thorn bushes and trailing vines the rock thing had found his trail and was after him again a second time harley fled through the dim lighted night stumbling over boulders and tripping on creepers but this time his flight was not that of panic Frightened enough he was, but his mind was working clearly as he leapt through the forest away from the source of the crashing. The first thing he noted was that, though, as far as his ears could inform him, he was managing to keep his lead, he wasn't out distancing his horrible pursuer by a yard. Dark though the night was, and far away as he contrived to keep himself, the colossus seemed to cling to his trail as easily as though following a well-blazed path. He climbed a tree, faced at right angles to the course he had pursued, and swung for the next tree. It was a long jump, but desperation lent abnormal power to his muscles, and the gravity regulator adjusted to extremely low pitch was a great help. He made it safely. Another swinging leap into the dark, to land sprawling in a second tree, a third, a fourth. Finally he crouched in a tangle of boughs and listened. He was a quarter of a mile from the point where he had turned from his first direction. Perhaps this deviation would throw the rock terror off. It didn't. He heard the steady smashing noise stop. For an instant there was a silence in the darkness of the asteroid that was painful. Then the crashing was resumed, this time drawing straight toward where he was hidden. 
Somehow the thing had learned of his change of direction. He continued his flight into the night, his eyes staring glassily into the darkness, his expression the ghastly one of a condemned man. And as he fled, the crashing behind him told him how he was followed, easily, infallibly, in spite of all his twisting and turning and efforts at concealment. What a hellish intelligence the monster must possess! He ran for eternities. He ran till his chest was on fire and the sobbing agony of his breathing could be heard for yards. He ran till spots of fire floated before his eyes, and the blood, throbbing in his brain, cut off the noise of the devilish pursuit behind him. At long last his legs buckled under him, and he fell to rise no more. He was done. He knew it. He was the position of the hunted animal that lies panting, every muscle paralyzed with absolute exhaustion, and glares in an agony of helplessness at the hunter whose approach spells death. The crashing grew louder. The tremor of the ground grew more pronounced as the vast pursuer pounded along with its tons and tons of weight. Harley gazed into the blackness back along the way he had come. His eyes sunk deep in the hollows fatigue had carved in his face and waited for the end. The dark night darkened still more with the approach of another swift, inexorable dawn. There was a terrific rending of tree trunks and webbed creepers. Dimly in the darkness he could see something that towered on a level with the tallest trees, something that moved as rapidly and steadily as though driven by machinery. Fear so great that it nauseated him swept over him in waves, but he could not move. The first gray smear of dawn appeared in the sky. In the ghostly grayness he got a clearer and clearer sight of the monster. He groaned and cowered there while it approached him, more slowly now, eyeing him with staring stony orbs in which there was no expression of any kind, of rage or bait, of curiosity or triumph. Great stumps of legs with no joints in them on which the colossus stalked like a moving stone tower. A body resembling an enormous boulder carved by an amateurish hand to portray the trunk of a human being. A craggy sphere of rock for a head, set directly atop the deeply riven shoulders. A face like the horrible mask of an embryonic gargoyle. A mouth that was simply a lipless chasm that opened and closed with the sound of rocks grinding together in a slow-moving glacier the whole veiled thinly by trailing lengths of snapping vines, great shattered tree boughs, bushes, all uprooted in its stumping march through the forest. Harley closed his eyes to shut out the sight, but in spite of himself they flashed open again and stared on, as though hypnotized by the spectacle they witnessed. The gray of dawn lightened to the first rose tint of the rising sun. As though stung to action by the breaking of day, the thing hastened its ground-shaking pace. With one last stride it came to Harley's side and loomed far above, the unwinking eyes glaring down at him. The three arms, hinged at equidistant points at the base of the horrible head, slowly lowered toward his prostrate form. There was a grating noise as the creature hinged in the middle and bent low, bringing its enormous, staring eyes within two yards of his face. One of its hands closed over his leg, tentatively, experimentally, as though to ascertain of what substance he was made. He cried aloud as the rock vice, like a gigantic lobster claw, squeezed tight. The thing drew back abruptly. Then the chasm of its mouth opened a little, for all the world as though giving vent to soundless, demonic laughter. All three of the vice-like hands clamped over him, lightly enough considering their vast size, and intimating that the Colossus did not mean to kill him for a moment or two, but so cruelly that his senses swam with the pain of it. He felt the grip relax. The stone pincers were lifted from him, slithering to the ground beside him. The first blinding rays of the sun were beating straight on the colossal figure, which glittered fantastically, like a huge splintered opal in their brilliance. It glared down at Harley. The abyss of a mouth opened, 
as though giving vent to a silent infernal laughter then with the noise of a landslide the giant form settled slowly to the ground the rock half moons of curtains dropped over the expressionless dull eyes the whole great figure quivered and grew still it lay without movement stretched along the ground like a craggy opalescent hill dazed stunned by such fantastic behavior harley struggled wearily to his feet he had been a dead man as surely as though shot with a ray gun one twitch of those terrible rock pincers would have broken him in two pieces it had seemed as though the deadly twitch were surely forthcoming and then the thing had released him had laid down to go to sleep or was it asleep he took a few slow steps away from it expecting to see the three great tentacles flash out to capture him as a cat claws at a mouse that it thinks is escaping the arms didn't move astonishing as this was harley was free to run away if he chose why was that a hint of a clue to the creature's action began to unfold in his mind when he had first laid eyes on it in daylight it was asleep it had not pursued him during the preceding day which argued that again it was asleep and now with the first touch of dawn it was once more quiet immobile the answer seemed to be that it was entirely nocturnal that for some obscure unguessable reason sunlight induced in it a state of suspended animation it seemed an insane theory but no other surmise was remotely reasonable but if it were invariably sunk in a coma during daylight why had it delayed killing him just a moment ago its every action indicated that it possessed intelligence of a high order it was more than probable that it realized its limitation why didn't it act in accordance with that realization on thinking it over he believed he had an answer to that too he remembered the way the gaping mouth had seemed to express devilish mirth the thing was playing with him that was all it had saved him for another night of hopeless flight and infallible trailing through the forests of z forty he gazed at the monster in a frenzy of impotent rage and fear if only he could kill it somehow in its sleep but he couldn't in no way could he harm it secure in its silicate covering it was impervious to his wildest attempts at destruction and it knew it too hadn't it laughed just before sinking down to slumber through the asteroidal day with his go drill he might have pierced that silicon dioxide armor until he reached the creature's gritty flesh then he could have used his ray pistol possibly disintegrating all its vitals and leaving only an empty rock shell sprawling hugely there in the trampled underbrush but he had neither drill nor pistol one had been wrecked by the monster the other he had dropped in his madness of fright after completely exhausting its power chamber half crazed by the hopelessness of his plight he paced up and down beside the great length of the animated stone trapped on an asteroid utterly unarmed alone with the most pitiless invulnerable creature nature had placed in a varied universe could hell itself have devised a more terrible fate shuddering he turned away he had some two and a half hours of grace before the sun should set again and the darkness released the colossus from its torpor there was only one thing he could do place the diameter of the sphere between the thing and himself and try to exist through another night of terror his hands went to his belt to adjust the gravity regulator strapped about his waist by reducing his weight to an ounce or two he could make the long journey possible for his fatigued numbed muscles his hands clenched into fists and his breath whistled between his set teeth as a wild hope came to him the touch of the regulator had brought inspiration a way to defeat the gigantic creature stretched on the ground beside him a way to banish it forever from the surface of this lovely little world where all was perfect but the monstrous thing with which it was cursed Trembling with the reaction wrought in him by the faint glow of hope, he began to race toward the lake, 
and his wrecked Blinko dart. It wasn't hard to find the way. The rock giant had left a trail as broad as a road, trees broken off like celery stalks, bushes smashed flat, tracks that looked like shallow wells sunk into the firm ground. Fifty yards to a step, he leaped along this path, praying that one object, just one bit of machinery in the dark, had escaped the general wreckage. Arriving at the small shell at last, he was forced to pause a moment and compose himself before he could step into the battered interior. Everything hinged on this one final chance. Drawing a long breath, he entered the cabin and made his way to the stern repeller. A groan escaped his lips. It was ruined. Evidently the thing had reached in the manhole opening with one of its three mighty tentacles and, with sure instinct, had fastened its stone claws on the repeller housing. At any rate, it was ground to bits. But there was the bow repeller. He went to that, and the flame of hope came back to his eyes. It was untouched. He threw back the housing to make sure. Yes, the inner sliding series of plates that reversed or neutralized gravitational attraction at a touch were in alignment. He bent to the task of disconnecting it from the heavy bed plate to which it was bolted, his fingers flying frenziedly. Then back to the torpid colossus he hurried clutching the precious repeller tight in his arms, lest he should drop it, walking carefully lest he should fall with it. Then he was faced with a new difficulty that at first seemed insurmountable. How could he fasten the repeller to the great, impenetrable, opalescent bulk? A second time he bounded back toward the dark, to return with the heavy bow and stern bed plates from its hull. Once more the orange ball of the sun was sinking low. The terrible brevity of those three-hour days. He had less than ten minutes, earth time, in which to work. One of the thing's arms, or tentacles, was pointed out away from the parent mass. It was twice the diameter of his body, and was ponderously heavy, but by rigging a fulcrum and lever device, with a stone as the fulcrum, and a tough log as the lever, he managed to raise it high enough to thrust one of the bed plates under it. The other massive metal sheet he laid across the top. The lower rim of the sun touched the horizon. A tremor ran through the colossus. In frantic haste, racing against the flying seconds, Harley clamped the two plates tight against the columnar tentacle with four long hull bolts from the dark. He set the repeller in position on the top bed plate and began to fasten it down. He felt another tremor run through the stone column on which he was squatting. With a rasping sound, one of the half-moon rock curtains the thing had for eyelids blinked open and shut. He shot the last bolt into place and tightened it. The stone claws, just behind which he had fastened the repeller, ground savagely shut. The great tentacle began to lift and carry him with it toward the chasm of a mouth. That chasm opened wide. Harley straightened up and jumped for the ground. As he jumped, he kicked the repeller control bar hard over. There was a shrieking of the wind as though all the hurricanes in the universe were battling each other. He felt himself turned over and over, buffeted, torn at, in a mad aerial whirlpool. The whirlpool calm as the abruptly created vacuum caused by the monster's rapid drive upward passed after it into space. Far overhead, there was one fleeting glimpse of a pinpoint of dull opalescence reflecting the rays of the dying sun. Then the pinpoint disappeared in the fathomless space. With his gravity regulator adjusted to the point where it almost neutralized his weight, he fell slowly back to the ground. Almost immediately after he had landed in the darkness that blanketed the surface of the planetoid, a big space yacht settled down near him. A searchlight bore a hole in the blackness to bathe him in cold light. Down the beam came a band of men from Earth, pushing atomic cannon and gazing apprehensively about them. In the lead was an elderly man with a six-bar dollar-mark insignia of a business executive on his purple tunic. 
he hastened to Harley's side. Harley only dimly heard what he said. Something to the effect that the man had been worried after selling the fatal asteroid, had got in touch with Radivision Corporation, and learned that his call number was dead, had come with men and big guns to rescue him, if it wasn't too late, and take him back to Earth, had cruised for half an hour before locating him. I've been calling myself a murderer ever since I let you have Z-40, Mr. 2Q14N20, he concluded. I was sure we'd get here only to find that you'd been killed. But I see you've managed to escape from the creature so far. Though, by the look of you, it must have been a narrow shave. At this, Harley shook off the gathering dizziness that hazed his mind. He threw back his shoulders. Managed to escape? I did better than that. I got rid of the thing forever. Yes, I'll return to Earth with you, but only because I need a new Blinko dart. I'm coming back to Z-40 at once. Perfect little paradise, now that I've got rid of that inanimate rock pile. The belated rescuers caught him as he collapsed. This implement, invented by Blansko 9X247A in 2052, is not so much a drill as a compressor. It is something superficially defined in the Universal Dictionary, 2061 edition, as a portable mechanism which, by altering gaseous blasts of extreme heat and cold, breaks down the atoms of inorganic matter, causing them to collapse together in dense compression. Thus, a cubic yard of Earth can be reduced in size, in a few moments, to a pebble no larger than a pea, which pebble would weigh, on Earth, close to a ton. End of the Planetoid of Peril by Paul Ernst This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Project Hush by William Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. Project Hush by William Ten. The biggest job in history, and it had to be done with complete secrecy. It was which was just the trouble. I guess I'm just a stickler, a perfectionist, but if you do a thing, I always say, you might as well do it right. Everything satisfied me about the security measures on our assignment except one. The official army designation. I don't know who thought it up, and I certainly would never ask, but whoever it was, he should have known better. Damn it, when you want a project kept secret, you don't give it a designation like that. You give it something neutral, some name, like the Manhattan and Overlord they used in World War II, which won't excite anybody's curiosity. But we were stuck with Project Hush, and we had to take extra measures to ensure secrecy. A couple of times a week, everyone on the project had to report to Psycho for DD and HA, dream detailing and hypnoanalysis, instead of the usual monthly visit. Naturally, the commanding general of the heavily fortified research post to which we were attached could not ask what we were doing under penalty of court-martial, but he had to be given further instructions to shut off his imagination like a faucet every time he heard an explosion. Some idiot in Washington was actually going to list Project Hush in the military budget by name. It took fast action, I can tell you, to have it entered under miscellaneous X research. Well, we covered the unforgivable blunder, though not easily, and now we could get down to the real business of the project. You know, of course, about the A-bomb, H-bomb, and C-bomb, because information that they existed 
had been declassified. You don't know about the other weapons being devised, and neither did we, reasonably enough, since they weren't our business. But we had been given properly guarded notification that they were in the works. Project Hush was set up to counter the new weapons. Our goal was not just to reach the moon. We had done that on 24th of June, 1967, with an unmanned ship that carried instruments to report back data on soil, temperature, cosmic rays, and so on. Unfortunately, it was put out of commission by a rock slide. An unmanned rocket would be useless against the new weapons. We had to get to the moon before any other country did, and set up a permanent station, an armed one, and do it without anybody else knowing about it. I guess you see now why we on, damn the name, Project Hush, were so concerned about security. But we felt pretty sure before we took off that we had plugged every possible leak. We had all right. Nobody even knew we had raised ship. We landed at the northern tip of Mare Nubium, just off Regio Montanus, and after planting a flag with appropriate throat-catching ceremony, had swung into the realities of the tasks we had practiced on so many dry runs back on Earth. Major Monroe Gridley prepared the big rocket, with its tiny cubicle of living space, for the return journey to Earth, which he alone would make. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Hawthorne painstakingly examined our provisions and portable quarters for any damage that might have been incurred in landing, and I, Colonel Benjamin Rice, first commanding officer of Army Base No. 1 on the moon, dragged crate after enormous crate out of the ship on my aching academic back, and piled them in the spot two hundred feet away where the plastic dome would be built. We all finished at just about the same time as per schedule and went into phase two. Monroe and I started work on building the dome. It was a simple prefab affair, but big enough to require an awful lot of assembling. Then, after it was built, we faced the real problem, getting all the complex internal machinery in place and in operating order. Meanwhile, Tom Hawthorne took his plump self off in the single-seater rocket which, up to then, had doubled as a lifeboat. The schedule called for him to make a rough three-hour scouting survey in an ever-widening spiral from our dome. This had been regarded as a probable waste of time, rocket fuel, and manpower, but a necessary precaution. He was supposed to watch for such things as bug-eyed monsters out for a stroll on the lunar landscape. Basically, however, Tom's survey was intended to supply extra geological and astronomical meat for the report which Monroe was to carry back to Army HQ on Earth. Tom was back in forty minutes. His round face, inside its transparent bubble helmet, was fish-belly white. And so were ours, once he told us what he'd seen. He had seen another dome. The other side of Mare Nubium, in the Rifane Mountains, he babbled excitedly. It's a little bigger than ours, and it's a little flatter on top, and it's not translucent either, with splotches of different colors here and there. It's a dull, dark, heavy gray. But that's all there is to see. No markings on the dome? I asked worriedly. No signs of anyone or anything around it? Neither, Colonel. I noticed he was calling me by my rank for the first time since the trip started, which meant he was saying, in effect, Man, have you got a decision to make? Hey, Tom, Monroe put in. Couldn't be just a regularly shaped bump in the ground, could it? I'm a geologist, Monroe. I can distinguish artificial from natural topography. Besides, he looked up, I just remembered something I left out. There's a brand new tiny crater near the dome. The kind usually left by a rocket exhaust. Rocket exhaust? I seized on that. Rockets, eh? Tom grinned a little sympathetically. Spaceship exhaust, I should have said. You can't tell from the crater what kind of propulsive device these characters are using. It's not the same kind of crater our rear jets leave, if that helps any. Of course it didn't. So we went into our ship and had a council of war. And I do mean war. 
Both Tom and Monroe were calling me Colonel in every other sentence. I used their first names every chance I got. Still, no one but me could reach a decision about what to do, I mean. Look, I said at last, here are the possibilities. They know we are here, either from watching us land a couple of hours ago or from observing Tom's scout ship, or they did not know we are here. They are either humans from Earth, in which case they are in all probability enemy nationals, or they are alien creatures from another planet, in which case they may be friends, enemies, or what have you. I think common sense and standard military procedure demand that we consider them hostile until we have evidence to the contrary. Meanwhile, we proceed with extreme caution so as not to precipitate an interplanetary war with potentially friendly Martians or whatever they are. All right, it's vitally important that Army headquarters be informed of this immediately. But since Moon to Earth radio is still on the drawing boards, the only way we can get through is to send Monroe back with the ship. If we do, we run the risk of having our garrison force, Tom and me, captured while he's making the return trip. In that case, their side winds up in possession of important information concerning our personnel and equipment. While our side has only the bare knowledge that somebody or something else has a base on the moon. So our primary need is more information. Therefore, I suggest that I sit in the dome on one end of a telephone hook up with Tom, who will sit in the ship, his hand over the firing button, ready to blast off for Earth the moment he gets the order from me. Monroe will take the single-seater down to the Riffane Mountains, landing as close to the other dome as he thinks safe. He will then proceed the rest of the way on foot, doing the best scouting job he can in the spacesuit. He will not use his radio, except for agreed-upon nonsense syllables to designate landing the single-seater, coming upon the dome by foot, and warning me to tell Tom to take off. If he's captured, remembering that the first purpose of a scout is acquiring and transmitting knowledge of the enemy, he will snap his suit radio on full volume and pass on as much data as time and the enemy's reflexes permit. How does that sound to you? They both nodded, and as far as they were concerned, the command decision had been made. But I was sitting under two inches of sweat. One question, Tom said. Why did you pick Monroe for the scout? I was afraid you'd ask that, I told him. We're three extremely unathletic PhDs who have been in the Army since we finished our schooling. There isn't too much choice. But I remember that Monroe is half Indian. Arapaho, isn't it, Monroe? And I'm hoping blood will tell. Only trouble, Colonel, Monroe said slowly as he rose, is that I'm one-fourth Indian, and even that. Didn't I ever tell you that my great-grandfather was the only Arapaho scout who was with Custer at the Little Bighorn? He'd been positive Sitting Bull was miles away. However, I'll do my best. And if I heroically don't come back, would you please persuade the security officer of our section to clear my name for use in the history books? Under the circumstances, I think it's the least he could do. I promised to do my best, of course. After he took off, I sat in the dome over the telephone connection to Tom and hated myself for picking Monroe to do the job. But I'd have hated myself just as much for picking Tom. And if anything happened, and I had to tell Tom to blast off, I'd probably been sitting here in the dome all by myself after that, waiting. Brosnegi came over the radio in Monroe's resonant voice. He had landed the single-seater. I didn't dare use the telephone to chat with Tom and the ship, for fear I might miss an important word or phrase from our scout. So I sat and sat and strained my ears. After a while, I heard Mishkashu, which told me that Monroe was in the neighborhood of the other dome and was creeping toward it under cover of whatever boulders were around. And then abruptly, I heard Monroe yell my name, and there was a terrific clattering in my headphones. 
Radio interference! He'd been caught, and whoever had caught him had simultaneously jammed his suit transmitter with a larger transmitter from the alien dome. Then there was silence. After a while, I told Tom what had happened. He just said, Poor Monroe. I had a good idea of what his expression was like. Look, Tom, I said, if you take off now, you still won't have anything important to tell. After capturing Monroe, whatever's in that other dome will come looking for us, I think. I'll let them get close enough for us to learn something of their appearance, at least if they're human or non-human. Any bit of information about them is important. I'll shout it up to you, and you'll still be able to take off in plenty of time, all right? You're the boss, Colonel, he said in a mournful voice. Lots of luck. And then there was nothing to do but wait. There was no oxygen system in the dome yet, so I had to squeeze up a sandwich from the food compartment in my suit. I sat there thinking about the expedition. Nine years and all that careful secrecy, all that expenditure of money, and mind-cracking research. And it had come to this, waiting to be wiped out in a blast from some unimaginable weapon. I understood Monroe's last request. We often felt we were so secret that our immediate superiors didn't even want us to know what we were working on. Scientists are people. They wish for recognition, too. I was hoping the whole expedition would be written up in the history books, but it looked unpromising. Two hours later, the scout ship landed near the dome. The lock opened, and from where I stood in the open door of our dome, I saw Monroe come out and walk toward me. I alerted Tom and told him to listen carefully. It may be a trick. He might be drugged. He didn't act drugged, though. Not exactly. He pushed his way past me and sat down on a box to one side of the dome. He put his booted feet up on another, smaller box. How are you, Ben? he asked. How's every little thing? I grunted. Well, I know my voice skittered a bit. He pretended puzzlement. Well, what? Oh, I see what you mean. The other dome. You want to know who's in it? You have a right to be curious, Ben, certainly. The leader of a top-secret expedition like this, Project Hush, they call us, huh, Ben? Finds another dome on the moon? He thinks he's been the first to land on it, so naturally he wants to. Major Monroe Gridley, I rapped out. You will come to attention and deliver your report now. Honestly, I felt my neck swelling up inside my helmet. Monroe just leaned back against the side of the dome. That's the army way of doing things, he commented admiringly. Like the recruits say, there's a right way, a wrong way, and an army way. Only there are other ways, too, he chuckled. Lots of other ways. He's off, I heard Tom whisper over the telephone. Ben, Monroe has gone and blown his stack. They aren't extraterrestrials in the other dome, Ben, Monroe volunteered in a sudden burst of sanity. No, they're human, all right, and from Earth. Guess where? I'll kill you, I warned him. I swear I'll kill you, Monroe. Where are they from? Russia? China? Argentina? He grimaced. What's so secret about those places? Go on. Guess again. I stared at him long and hard. The only place else... Sure, he said. You got it, Colonel. The other dome is owned and operated by the Navy. The goddamn United States Navy. End of Project Hush by William Ten. Reluctant Genius by Henry Slaser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Reluctant Genius by Henry Slaser. It is said that life crawled up from the slime of the sea bottoms and became man because of inherent greatness bred into him before the dawn of time. 
but perhaps this urge was not as formless as we think. Buos was chastening Laloy as they sped through the ionosphere of the green planet. But like the airy creature she was, Laloy ignored the criticism and rippled zephyr-like through the clump of daffodils when they completed their descent. So pretty, she sighed. She flung her incorporeal substance around each flower, absorbing their unified beauty of scent, sight, and feel. Buos trilled himself into a column of wind to express his displeasure at her attitude. Stupid, silly, shallow thing, he said. If the others only knew how you behave. And you'll be glad to tell them, of course, she said, extending a finger of air into the roots of the wind-bent grass. She rolled across the hill ecstatically and Buos followed in grumbling billows of energy. "'I don't carry tales,' he replied, somewhat mortified. "'But we're here as observers, and you insist on making this world a plaything.' "'I love it,' she said happily. "'It's so warm and green.' Buos whipped in front of her angrily. "'This is an assignment,' he snapped, his emotions crackling in the air about him. "'We have a purpose here.' purpose she groaned settling over a patch of crowded clover how many centuries will this assignment last this world is young said buos it will take time but how long she said mournfully our world will be shriveled and dead before these people have the knowledge to rescue us why can't we spend our lives here and leave the others behind said buos stiffly selfish being he said sadly this world cannot support one-fourth of our number oh i know i know laloy said i do not mean to say such things i am twisted by my sorrow as if to express her self-abnegation she corkscrewed out of the clover and into a thin spiral of near nothingness settle down foolish one said buos not unkindly i know your feelings do you think I am not tormented as well by the slow pace of these earth things, crude, barbaric beings, like children, with the building blocks of science? They have such a long way to go. And so few know, said Laloy despairingly, a handful of seeing minds, tens of millions of ignorant ones, not even first principles. They're stupid, stupid but they will learn buos said stubbornly that is a historical fact some day they will know the true meaning of matter and light and energy slowly yes slowly but in terms of their growth it will seem like great speed to them and in terms of our world said laloy spinning sadly over the ground they may be far too late no in his excitement buos forgot himself and entwined with the flowing form of the she-creature and the result was a rending of the air that crackled like heat lightning over the field no he repeated again they must not be too late they must learn they must learn from the very ground and then they must fly and then their eyes must be lifted to the stars and the desire must extend them to all of the universe it seems so hopeless it cannot be our destiny is not extinction they must come to us in fleets of silver and replant our soil and send towers of green shooting into our sky breathing out air yes yes laloy cried pitifully it will be that way buos it will be that way that man creature we will begin with him buos floated earthward disconsolately he is a dreamer he said cheerlessly his mind is good he thinks of tomorrow he is one of the knowing ones but he cannot be moved laloy his thoughts may fester and die in the prison of his brain no they will not we have watched him he understands much he will help us i have seen his like before said buos hopelessly he thinks and he works and his conclusions will die stillborn for lack of a moving force then let us provide it buos let us move him with what said the other disdainfully arms of nothing hands of vacuum a breeze against his cheek a rustle of leaves a meaningless whistle in his ear let us try let us try 
This empty watchfulness is destroying us. Let us move him, Buos. Come. Faster than the sky-sweeping clouds they flew, over the gently swelling hills, over the yearning branches of trees, over the calm blue waters of the lake. Swifter than the flight of birds they came, searching for a thinking mind. They found him at last. He knows, he knows, said Laloy. Only how to say, this is so because, and this must happen when. Only to think, to understand. They hovered over his head in a pandemonium of helplessness. They whirled and tumbled and shrilly circled. And then to Laloy the inspiration came. The apple, caught by a sudden gust of wind, twisted from its tenuous hold on the tree and fell to the ground. The man, startled, picked it up. He gazed at it, deep in thought. The End of The Reluctant Genius by Henry Slazer A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Lieber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Lieber Don't wait to get em while they're hot. By then, it is too late to get em at all. The big bright doors of the office building parted with a pneumatic whoosh, and Robbie glided into Times Square. The crowd that had been watching the fifty-foot-tall girl on the clothing billboard get dressed, or reading the latest news about the hot truce scrawl itself in yard-high script, hurried to look. Robbie was still a novelty. Robbie was fun. For a little while yet, he could steal the show. But the attention did not make Robbie proud. He had no more emotion than the pink plastic giantess, who dressed and undressed endlessly whether there was a crowd, or the street was empty, and who never once blinked her blue mechanical eyes. But she merely drew business, while Robbie went out after it. For Robbie was the logical conclusion of the development of the vending machine. All the earlier ones had stood in one place, on a floor, or hanging on a wall, and blankly delivered merchandise in return for coins, whereas Robbie searched for customers. He was the demonstration model of a line of sales robots to be manufactured by Schuler vending machines, provided the public invested enough in stocks to give the company capital to go into mass production. The publicity Robbie drew stimulated investments handsomely. It was amusing to see the TV and newspaper coverage of Robbie's selling, but not a fraction as much fun as being approached personally by him. Those who were usually bought anywhere from one to five hundred shares, if they had any money, and foresight enough to see that sales robots would eventually be on every street and highway in the country. Robbie radared the crowd, found that it surrounded him solidly, and stopped. With a carefully built-in sense of timing, he waited for the tension and expectation to mount before he began talking. Say, Ma, he doesn't look like a robot at all, a child said. He looks like a turtle, which was not completely inaccurate. The lower part of Robbie's body was a metal hemisphere hemmed with sponge rubber and not quite touching the sidewalk. The upper was a metal box with black holes in it. The box could swivel and duck. A chromium bright hoop skirt with a turret on top. Reminds me too much of the little Joe Paratanks, a legless veteran of the Persian War muttered and rapidly rolled himself away on wheels rather like Robbie's. His departure made it easier for some of those who knew about Robbie to open a path in the crowd. Robbie headed straight for the gap. The crowd whooped. Robbie glided very slowly down the path, deftly jogging aside whenever he got too close to ankles in skylon or soccasins. The rubber buffer on his hoop skirt was merely an added safeguard. The boy who had called Robbie a turtle jumped in the middle of the path and stood his ground, grinning foxily. Robbie stopped two feet short of him. The turret ducked. The crowd got quiet. Hello, youngster, Robbie said in a voice that was smooth as that of a TV star. 
and was, in fact, a recording of one. The boy stopped smiling. Hello, he whispered. How old are you? Robbie asked. Nine. No, eight. That's nice, Robbie observed. A metal arm shot down from his neck, stopped just short of the boy. The boy jerked back. For you, Robbie said. The boy gingerly took the red polylock from the neatly fashioned blunt metal claws and began to unwrap it. Nothing to say? asked Robbie. Uh, thank you. After a suitable pause, Robbie continued. And how about a nice refreshing drink of poppy pop to go with your poly lolly? The boy lifted his eyes, but didn't stop licking the candy. Robbie waggled his claws slightly. Just give me a quarter, and within five seconds, a little girl wiggled out of the forest of legs. Give me a polylop too, Robbie, she demanded. Rita, come back here, a woman in the third rank of the crowd called angrily. Robbie scanned the newcomer gravely. His reference silhouettes were not good enough to let him distinguish the sex of children, so he merely repeated, Hello, youngster. Rita, give me a polylop. Disregarding both remarks, for a good salesman is single-minded and does not waste bait. Robbie said winningly, I'll bet you read Junior Space Killers. Now I have here, uh-uh, I'm a girl. He got a polylop. At the word girl, Robbie broke off. Rather ponderously, he said, I'll bet you read Gigi Jones Space Stripper. Now I have here the latest issue of that thrilling comic not yet in the stationary vending machines. Just give me fifty cents, and within five, please let me through, I'm her mother. A young woman in the front rank drawled over her powder-sprayed shoulders. I'll get her for you, and slithered out on six-inch platform shoes. Run away, children, she said nonchalantly. Lifting her arms behind her head, she pirouetted slowly before Robbie to show how much she did for the bolero half-jacket and her form-fitting slacks that melted into skylons just above the knees. The little girl glared at her. She ended the pirouette in profile. At this age level, Robbie's reference silhouettes permitted him to distinguish sex, though with occasional amusing and embarrassing miscalls. He whistled admiringly. The crowd cheered. Someone remarked critically to a friend, it would go over better if he were built more like a real robot, you know, like a man. The friend shook his head. This way it's subtler. No one in the crowd was watching the news script overhead as it scribbled, Ice pack for hot truce? Vanadin hints Russ may yield on Pakistan. Robbie was saying, In the savage new glamour tint we have christened Mars blood, complete with spray applicator, and a fit-all nail stalls that mask every finger completely, except for the nails. Just give me five dollars. Uncrumpled bills may be fed into the revolving roller you see beside my arm. And within five seconds... No thanks, Robbie, the young woman yawned. Remember, Robbie persisted, for three more weeks seductivizing Mars blood will be unobtainable from any other robot or human vendor. No thanks. Robbie scanned the crowd resourcefully. Is there any gentleman here, he began, just as a woman elbowed her way through the front rank. I told you to come back, she snapped at the little girl. But I didn't get my polylop. Who would care to? Rita! Robbie cheated! Ow! Meanwhile, the young woman in the half bolero had scanned the nearby gentleman on her own deciding that there was less than a fifty percent chance of any of them accepting the proposition Robbie seemed about to make. She took advantage of the scuffle to slither gracefully back into the ranks. Once again, the path was clear before Robbie. He paused, however, for a brief recapitulation of the more magical properties of Mars blood, including a telling phrase about the passionate claws of the Martian sunrise. No one bought. It wasn't quite time. Soon enough, silver coins would be clinking, bills going through the rollers faster than laundry, and five hundred people struggling for the privilege of having their money taken away from them 
by America's first mobile sales robot. But there were still some tricks that Robbie had to do free, and one certainly should enjoy those before starting the more expensive fun. So Robbie moved on until he reached the curb. The variation in level was instantly sensed by his underscanners. He stopped. His head began to swivel. The crowd watched in eager silence. This was Robbie's best trick. Robbie's head stopped swiveling. His scanners had found the traffic light. It was green. Robbie edged forward, but then the light turned red. Robbie stopped again, still on the curb. The crowd softly awed its delight. It was wonderful to be alive and watching Robbie on such an exciting day. Alive and amused in the fresh, weather-controlled air, between the lines of bright skyscrapers with their winking windows, and under a sky so blue you could almost call it dark. But way, way up where the crowd could not see, the sky was darker still. Purple dark, with stars showing. And in that purple dark, a silver-green something, the color of a bud, plunged down at better than three miles a second. The silver green was a newly developed paint that foiled radar. Robbie was saying, while we wait for the light, there's time for you youngsters to enjoy a nice refreshing poppy pop. Or, for you adults, only those over five feet tall are eligible to buy, to enjoy an exciting poppy pop fizz. Just give me a quarter or in the case of adults one dollar and a quarter i am licensed to dispense intoxicating liquors and within five seconds but that was not cutting it fine enough just three seconds later the silver green bud bloomed over manhattan into a globular orange flower the skyscrapers grew brighter and brighter still the brightness of the inside of the sun the windows winked blossoming white fire flowers the crowd around Robbie bloomed too. Their clothes puffed into petals of flame. Their heads of hair were torches. The orange flower grew, stem and blossom. The blast came. The winking windows shattered tier by tier, became black holes. The walls bent, rocked, cracked. A stony dandruff flaked from their cornices. The flaming flowers on the sidewalk were all leveled at once. Robbie was shoved ten feet, his metal hoop skirt dimple regaining its shape. The blast ended. The orange flower, grown vast, vanished overhead on its huge magic beanstalk. It grew dark and very still. The cornice dandruff pattered down. A few small fragments rebounded from the metal hoop skirt. Robbie made some small, uncertain movements, as if feeling for broken bones. He was hunting for the traffic light, but it no longer shone either red or green. He slowly scanned a full circle. There was nothing anywhere to interest his reference silhouettes. Yet, whenever he tried to move, his underscanners warned him of low obstructions. It was very puzzling. The silence was disturbed by moans, and a crackling sound, as faint at first as the scampering of distant rats. A seared man, his charred clothes fuming where the blast had blown out the fire, rose from the curb. Robbie scanned him. Good day, sir, Robbie said. Would you care for a smoke? A truly cool smoke? Now I have here the yet unmarketed brand, but the customer had run away screaming and Robbie never ran after customers. Though he could follow them at a medium brisk roll, he worked his way along the curb where the men had sprawled, carefully keeping his distance from the low obstructions, some of which writhed now and then, forcing him to jaw. Shortly, he reached a fire hydrant. He scanned it. His electronic vision, though it still worked, had been somewhat blurred by the blast. Hello, youngster, Robbie said. Then, after a long pause, Cat got your tongue? Well, I have a little present for you. A nice, lovely polylop. Take it, youngster, he said after another pause. It's for you. Don't be afraid. His attention was distracted by other customers, 
who began to rise up oddly here and there, twisting forms that confused his reference silhouettes, and would not stay to be scanned properly. One cried, Water! But no quarter clinked in Robbie's claws when he caught the word and suggested, How about a nice refreshing drink of poppy pop? The rat crackling from the flames had become a jungle mutter. The blind windows began to wink fire again. A little girl marched, stepping neatly over arms and legs she did not look at. A white dress, and the once taller bodies around her, had shielded her from the brilliance and the blast. Her eyes were fixed on Robbie. In them was the same imperious confidence, though none of the delight with which she had watched him earlier. "'Help me, Robbie,' she said. "'I want my mother.' "'Hello, youngster,' Robbie said. "'What would you like? Comics? Candy? "'Where is she, Robbie? Take me to her. "'Balloons? Would you like to watch me blow up a balloon?' The little girl began to cry. The sound triggered off another of Robbie's novelty circuits, a service feature that had brought in a lot of favorable publicity. "'Is something wrong?' he asked. "'Are you in trouble? Are you lost?' "'Yes, Robbie, take me to my mother.' "'Stay right here,' Robbie said reassuringly. "'And don't be frightened. I will call a policeman.' He whistled shrilly twice. Time passed. Robbie whistled again. The windows flared and roared. The little girl begged, "'Take me away, Robbie,' and jumped onto the little step in his hoop skirt. "'Give me a dime,' Robbie said. The little girl found one in her pocket and put it in his claws. "'Your weight,' Robbie said, "'is fifty-four and one-half pounds. "'Have you seen my daughter? "'Have you seen her?' "'A woman was crying somewhere. "'I left her watching that thing while I stepped inside. "'Rita!' "'Robbie, help me!' the little girl began babbling at her. "'He knew I was lost.' He even called the police, but they didn't come. He weighed me, too, didn't you, Robbie? But Robbie had gone off to pedal Poppy Pop to the members of the rescue squad, which had just come around the corner, more robot-like in their asbestos suits than he in his metal skin. End of A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Lieber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Song in a Minor Key by Catherine Lucille Moore This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Song in a Minor Key by Catherine Lucille Moore. Northwest Smith is one of the great adventurers of science fiction, one of that group of cool, gray eyed men who roam the spaceways and provide much of the inspiration for the legends that are a part of the folklore of space. Here is Northwest Smith in a rare moment of peace in a remarkable vignette published here by permission of the author. He had been promising himself this moment for how many lonely months and years on alien worlds. Beneath him, the clovered hill slope was warm in the sun. Northwest Smith moved his shoulders against the earth and closed his eyes, breathing so deeply that the gun holstered upon his chest drew tight against its strap as he drank the fragrance of earth and clover warm in the sun here in the hollow of the hills willow shaded pillowed upon clover and the lap of earth he let his breath run out in a long sigh and drew one palm across the grass in a caress like a lover's he had been promising himself this moment for how long how many months and years on alien worlds he would not think of it now he would not remember the dark spaceways or the red slag of martian drylands or the pearl-gray days on venus 
when he had dreamed of the earth that had outlawed him so he lay with his eyes closed and the sunlight drenching him through no sound in his ears but the passage of a breeze through the grass and a creaking of some insect nearby the violent blood-smelling years behind him might never have been except for the gun pressed into his ribs between his chest and the clovered earth he might be a boy again years upon years ago long before he had broken his first law or killed his first man no one else alive now knew who that boy had been not even the all-knowing patrol not even venusian yarrow who had been his closest friend for so many riotous years no one would ever know now not his name which had not always been smith or his native land or the home that had bred him or the first violent deed that had sent him down the devious paths which led here here to the clover hollow in the hills of an earth that had forbidden him ever to set foot again upon her soil he unclasped the hands behind his head and rolled over to lay a scarred cheek on his arm smiling to himself well here was earth beneath him no longer a green star high in the alien skies but warm soil new clover so near his face he could see all the little stems and trefoil leaves moist earth granular at the roots an ant ran by with waving antennae close beside his cheek he closed his eyes and drew another deep breath better not even look better to lie here like an animal absorbing the sun and the feel of earth blindly wordlessly now he was not northwest smith scarred outlaw of the spaceways now he was a boy again with all his life before him there would be a white-columned house just over the hill with shaded porches and white curtains blowing in the breeze and the sound of sweet familiar voices indoors there would be a girl with hair like poured honey hesitating just inside the door lifting her eyes to him tears in the eyes he lay very still remembering curious how vividly it all came back though the house had been ashes for nearly twenty years and the girl the girl he rolled over violently opening his eyes no use remembering her there had been that fatal flaw in him from the very first he knew now if he were the boy again knowing all he knew to-day still the flaw would be there and sooner or later the same thing must have happened that had happened twenty years ago he had been born for a wilder age when men took what they wanted and held what they could without respect for law obedience was not in him and so as vividly as on that day it happened he felt the same old surge of anger and despair twenty years old now felt the ray-gun bucking hard against his unaccustomed fist heard the hiss of its deadly charge ravening into a face he hated he could not be sorry even now for that first man he had killed but in the smoke of that killing had gone up the columned house and the future he might have had the boy himself lost as atlantis now and the girl with the honey-coloured hair and much much else besides it had to happen he knew he being the boy he was it had to happen even if he could go back and start all over the tale would be the same and it was all long past now anyhow and nobody remembered any more at all except himself a man would be a fool to lie here thinking about it any longer smith grunted and sat up shrugging the gun into place against his ribs end of song in a minor key by catherine lucille moore